Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to have Doolin Tu and Caleb Pike with us. Um, we really respect their work, um, and we're going to talk all about documentary equipment and tools. So I'll start off by introducing both of them. Um, Doolin Tu is a professor of digital uh, media, and he's actually the director of digital media at Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. He's the co-founder of Creative, director of Resolution 7, which is a documentary and commercial production house. And then he also works as a cinematographer, photographer, writer, and multimedia consultant. And then we have Caleb Pike, who's a camera editor, operator, podcaster based in Chicago. Um, he's, his experience branches from documentary to commercial to film and education material. In 2010, he started the DSLR Video Shooter, where he podcasts, writes reviews, and shares tools and techniques for filmmakers, which I'm sure he'll talk a lot more about today. Great to be here. Yeah, and, um, and so we're also holding this chat in connection with the results um, of our 2013 Documentary Filmmaking Tools Survey. Um, and we just actually published the first version of that. So all you listeners can go and take a look. All right, so um, Caleb, would you like to start? Um, I think today both of us, both of you guys will start with demos, um, and then we'll take questions from viewers. So any of you guys out there um, who have questions, you know, anything regarding documentary tools and filmmaking, um, this is your time to ask those questions. So Caleb, I know you have some equipment for us to um, demo. Do you want to start? Sure, sure. Um, I don't know how much time we have, but I have a couple different things that we can uh, talk about quickly. Um, so the first thing I want to show you guys is this cage. This is from Wooden Camera. And the three items that I'm going to talk about quickly today um, are things that I will not leave the studio without because this stuff is used a ton. So um, this is the cage right here. It's a top handle uh, cage, fully metal. You can get these really hot leather handles for it. Um, love this thing. As you can see, I have a monitor. This is the DP4 uh, from Small HD mounted onto it. And it has a fantastic quick release system. So really quickly, I'm going to throw this on. Shoulder rig is rock solid, too. So you can see here it just blends, you know, becomes a part of the shoulder rig. And, uh, you know, you could move the monitor over. Then when you're done, pop it back off, throw it onto a monopod. So it's just a fantastic, fantastic, very robust, you know, kind of a gear that's going to last as long as you possibly could need it. So... Love that. That's from Wooden Camera. Uh, they have different sizes you can pick up for your DSLRs, and they also have cages for uh, other cameras, the Canon Cinema Series and other things like that. So love that thing. The next is this lens. This is the Tamron 24-70 to uh, constant aperture of f2.8, and it has something called VC, which stands for vibration control. And this lens lives on my camera bodies. Um, it's a fantastic lens. The biggest reason is because this is one of the very few, maybe the only one, that's a new uh, lens that has vibration control built into the lens, and it works on full-frame cameras. So I'll actually shoot just like this. I'll get a lot of B-roll like this. I have the cage, which is great, but that lens, that vibration control is so important. Um, stabilizing sensors on these big sensor cameras is very difficult with all the rolling shutter and other issues. So having this lens is incredible, and it really takes you know a lot of jitter out of all of your shots. And it's a lens that's going to stick with you if you upgrade to like a C100, 300, or any other lens with a um, active mount. This lens is going to work fantastic. So so that's the lens. Last thing I want to talk about is uh, reach back here a Porter brace bag. Um, Porter Brace just came out. These are killer bags. They make incredible bags, super durable. But they recently came out with um, some bags that are built for rigs and they're soft. So this is actually a soft bag. It's very light, but it's incredibly tough and durable. You can actually stand on a lot of these bags. They're very rigid, um, but they're light, easy to move around. And the idea is you just take your entire rig and just drop it right into the case. So you're not going to be dismantling all your cages and rigs and things. Because that's, that's the thing, is if you're shooting a documentary, you can't be messing around and playing with your gear. You have to be ready to shoot, ready to whip out your rig and start filming. So stuff like this is great, because I can just drop my camera in here, pull it back out quickly, and start shooting. So they have just 
uh, lots of accessories come with the bag. Super tough. Uh, you can't go wrong. So that's quarter brace, and they make tons of different sizes. They even make custom ones for Zakudo and Red Rock and other brands. So um, that's my stuff. I don't know how much time we have, so um, if we need to talk about more, I've got a few other things we can talk about. But we can go ahead and switch over. Thank you so much, Caleb. That's great. And I'm sure viewers will have a lot more questions in regard to what you were just showing us. So do. Um, we're so excited to see what you have for us today. Um, so today I want to talk about one of the primary cameras that I use. Well, I shoot on a lot of cameras, and that's that's you know it's 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 an exciting time to be a filmmaker. You can shoot the SLRs, you can shoot full you know uh, the FS seven hundred, the you know F fifty five. You have that kind of money. Uh, you know all sorts of uh, cameras are out there, but the one that I've been using a lot is the C one hundred for a couple reasons. Uh, this is the camera we use at. Columbia Journalism. All of our students use this, but also this is a camera I've been using for a while when it came out. I had debated about buying the C300A. The price point was a little high, about $15,000. This is about $6,000, so that's really good. Um, but there are some shortcomings with this camera, and I want to talk about how to kind of work around the main one, in my opinion, is audio. Audio almost feels like a, a you know a second, an afterthought on this camera. Um, you know, that's a bit unfair. They did think about it, but they could have done it a lot better, and I've had to do a little work around. Um, most of my work is run and gun, single shooter, doing audio as well. Uh, when I have the benefit of using my friend Sarah as the sound person, that's great. But you know, budgets being what they are, a lot of times I'm, I'm getting everything sound and audio. And and I don't know if you guys can see this. Um, the thing with the C um, uh, 100 is is the way that you control gain on the audio. So there's these little knobs right here that are really hard to get into and you actually have to flip down this camera, I mean this this cover on the camera and, and your, your finger has to find the groove that the, the knob is on. So it's actually, in, in, in practical terms, it's, it's very difficult to operate this while trying to capture the right image, while trying to uh, mix your audio. If someone gets really loud, you want to quickly turn it down and, and just this action, you, you're you going to pick up audio right there, right? Just that opening that up. You can leave this up but then that, that kind of falls down. Um, so this whole XLR audio device was attached to this top handle, and I actually like taking off the top handle. I, I don't use it that much, or I can put on another top handle because I have another audio solution for getting audio into the camera. Um, the camera comes with these XLR inputs, and but again, the big downside is is being able to control the the, the gain. And another downside is there's actually no headphone volume knob on this camera. There's no little wheels, so. If I'm trying to monitor audio, you're like I am listening through these headphones. It's hard to to quickly turn up and down the volume. Um, you can program these buttons on the back right here, and you can tap them to to have the volume go up and down. But who wants to do that during a situation where you're uh, recording an interview or or the handling in the field? Every bit of every bit of tapping, no matter how light, is going to create a uh, camera shake. So. Um, my solution around that is, is, is uh, a couple things. First, I'm going to take off this top handle um, right here. And it's a nice top handle. And if you want to use it just for a top handle, that's fine. But it kind of gets in the way because there's uh, the, the C100 is this weird turtle shape. It, it looks like a turtle, and then it gets really high with this, this bar. So to uh, you know preserve some of the compactness of the, what I liked about DSLR shooting, I just take off the, the top handle. But now I don't have any input. So what I'll use is my favorite device right here, which is the um, Sound Devices Mix Pre. Uh, I use this on the last film, Deep South, that I shot. Uh, the previous version, this is the Mix Pre D. And this is going to give you XLR inputs, but the, the, the really important thing is these, these, these three things right here, real knobs that you can turn on the fly. So something like this, I can gracefully kind of dial in the volume as opposed to trying to you know, shake that little circle. And also here, a headphone knob. So that's, that's going to be important because I want to quickly adjust. I don't have Sarah, my sound person all the time, most of the time I don't have her, and I want to be able to, to, to work um, quickly uh, while managing audio. So this has been designed for, this originally came out for DSLRs, there's a quarter 20 thread here, but same thing on the bottom of the uh, uh, C100, I can just attach it to the quarter 20 thread, screwing it in this way. Sorry, I'm trying to frame it out so you guys can see. Um, let me just put this down here. It's hard to work in my reflection in the in the webcam right there. And so once I attach that, you can see right here, it kind of sits at the bottom, has XLR inputs, and in the back, when I'm monitoring, for example, during an interview, I can quickly turn up the volume up and down. There's no camera friction by tapping 
uh, the volume here, and I'm not hunting and pecking by going to the side of the, the handle and looking for um, uh, the, 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 the volume wheel. Um, it's a little pricey. I think these things are about 700 bucks, uh, so you're, you're going to add that to the price of the C100, but now you can notice that the, the form factor is a lot shorter uh, than the handle, a little more compact, and I can actually hold it as I would with the, um, as I did with the DSLR. So this is a good solution if you have it. Obviously, money is always a concern, but these days I don't I don't have money for a sound person most of the time, and I want to make my life as easy as possible in the field while doing audio. So that's it. Uh, mix pre D, take off the top handle of the C100, and this has worked well for me um, in the field to get uh, audio to control audio and to to manage my headphones uh, much better than you can with the with the top handle. So yeah, that's my tip of the day, and then uh, hopefully that, that's helpful. Thank you so much. Um, so we have so many uh, user questions, so we're just going to dive right into those. Um, unless, Caleb, do you have any um, other remarks on what um, Du just showed us, or the other way around? Um, yeah, we don't have any questions right away. I can, I can cover some other stuff. Okay. Great. Cool. Um, so I'm just going to go to our first question, which I think will be perfect for you, Du. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from Melanie, um, and she asks, for entry-level videographers and recent graduates who want to make documentaries but no longer have access to their school's equipment and have limited budgets, what's the most important and valuable? So is there any advice that you usually give to recent graduates? Yeah, it's um, Caleb and I were just talking about this. So, so I mentioned here, students here learn on uh, $6,000 C100 cameras, right? As a grad student, you can't rub two dimes together to to you know, to to have dinner. So where are you going to get six thousand? So the DSLR is is a great uh, strategy. You know, a lot of my colleagues who you know, we're at stages in our career we can afford different cameras, and I've heard things like DSLRs are dead. And I was like, you have lost your mind. <laughs> if I were graduating today, I would buy a T5i, an SL1, a GH2, any of these cameras within my budget, and even an EOS M, which is about three hundred dollars now on eBay, because the picture quality. On these three, four, five hundred dollar cameras, was better than the images coming out of a twenty thousand dollar camera several years ago. So, so DSLR is, is affordable, but also there's the stills factor of it, right? These cameras are great, but they don't take stills. And, and these days, you know, especially for a journalism student, you're doing multiple things. You're doing uh, uh, audio, you're doing uh, video, and you're doing photos. And so you're going to be filing all. So you can't be a good DSLR. They're affordable. Obviously, and uh, you know, here Caleb's thoughts on this. Uh, a good lens. He says he has his 24 to 70 on his camera at all times. You need one good lens. You know, don't trip yourself up thinking that you need a ton of gear. One good lens that gives you good image quality, and if it has image stabilization or vibration control, that's fantastic. And a good set of mics. So you know, the body will change. Don't think that you have to get something like this or 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 a, a red camera or you know, FS 700. Go real cheap and spend a little more money on the lens and and. and um, the bodies that are out there, you could shoot a documentary with. And generally, what lenses are those? Um, so, so the my the the I use the lenses I use for my work. The primary eighty to ninety percent of shots is the Canon twenty four to one hundred five f four L. The reason being, uh, even though it's a uh, you know a slower lens at f four. Um, it has image stabilization. And the, the range of 24 to 105 is really good for a doc shooter when, when I don't have time to set my shots. You know, I would love to be able to use a series of Zeiss primes, but there's no way in the field that I'm swapping around primes to, to get the shots that I need, not, at least not in the type of work I do. So 24 to 105. If I need a longer lens, it's the uh, 70 to 200 f4. Now, you can spend a lot of more money on the 2.8, but with the f4, I actually never shoot wider than f4 or f5.6, especially with that focal distance, because the, 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 the depth of field is so shallow that even if I'm setting up an interview, shooting at about 150 millimeters, and I'm trying to do f4, the second the subject moves forward, they're going to be out of focus. So um, spend more money, in my opinion, on the IS, or vibration control, than the speed of the lens. But it sounds like Caleb has a great lens that combines the two, the 24 to 70, that has uh, image stabilization as well. So that's that, That's my tip right there. Great. And Caleb, do you have any other remarks about that? Um, yeah, I think he's right on, especially with the, you know, on the C, the Cinema Series cameras that Canon makes, the noise 
the image is so um, does image sensitivity so well that the F4 isn't going to hurt you, especially if you're going to be lighting your interviews. Um, if you're really on a tight budget, like I just got an email yesterday from a guy who only had you know between three and four hundred dollars for lenses, uh, but all those lenses are too expensive. So what you can do is you can get into Nikkor primes, which are the old Nikon manual lenses. For $15, you can get an adapter, and if you go to keh.com, they sell, they're like eBay, but they they control the quality a lot more. You can get a 50 millimeter f1.4 for around 100 bucks, um, and that's going to be a fully metal, gorgeous focus ring, so you're not dealing with a cheap Canon plasticky feel. Full metal, awesome lenses, so you can pick up a set of three lenses for around $500, or even cheaper if you're getting 2.8 lenses, so it's a great way to get it. Uh, stuff on the cheap. And actually, you know, it's not just cheap. Uh, those vintage lenses have such a unique look. They're I just killer. love them. Yeah, they're killer, and it's not it's not good for low price. They're just good, and they yeah. just happen to be low price. And so that's a great recommendation. Yeah, and if you're going to do those, get the AIS. So those are the 1980s. They're uh, better quality. They're going to be sharper, and these suckers are sharp. Like if you get a, you know, 51.4, those are sharp. They're not chintzy, cheap, soft lenses. Okay, great. Um, so let's go to our next question. Um, so, Caleb, question for you. Um, what would you recommend to include in a one-person DSLR interview kit, including lighting, audio, and then mobile enough to carry on your own? Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's a lot of options. So obviously your camera. Um, I tend to lean away from the Rebel cameras. Um, if you're going to get something more affordable, try the 60D, which has been replaced by a newer camera, so that's a lot more affordable. It's going to give you a lot more features that the Rebels won't have. Um, okay, audio would be the next thing. You know, a tripod, you can get like the Davis and Sanford Grounder tripod kit, which isn't behind me, but you can get that for like $150-ish. Uh, audio, there's a lot of audio recorders out there. $100 with like the H1 up to the H6. I think the newest one is or H5, and then you know Tascam has some great recorders as well. So you got to have that. Um, mic, you could get away with a shotgun microphone. There's a ton of those out there. Or if you were cheap like me when I got started, I just used my H4N on a uh, boom pole, and that worked really well. It's very sensitive, but if you don't have any money, it, it works well. So you can do that. Um, I have a wireless, Sennheiser wireless kit, and that thing, I swear by that thing. It's seven, eight hundred dollars maybe six to $700 for a kit, but I can't tell you how many times I've used that, and it saved me, so those are awesome. Uh, Lighting-wise, I did a review on my website of a kit that you can buy that comes with two lights. They're called, like, Octacool lights. There's an Octa 9 and an Octi 6 and they have six or nine bulbs. You get two of them. It's a softbox setup. What I do is I just stick the, um, uh, they have like a casing that goes on the outside to direct the light, and I set up two of those on a C-stand, and then I put a screw in front of it, and that gives me a lot of soft light, and then I can control it from there. So the C-stand is around $130. Totally worth it. It's going to last you forever. Uh, the lights are four to six hundred if you get a kit. You could buy just one if you need to save some money uh, for a hundred or two hundred dollars. So, and then lenses. I started with just a 50 millimeter lens, and I used that thing until I could afford more stuff. And then I got into Nick, uh, the Nikkor Primes. Um, so that's lens, camera, audio, mics, light, and I don't think I'm missing anything. But that would get you started. That's wonderful. Um, Dude can jump in if I if I miss something, but <laughs> yeah. off the top of my head, I think. No, I mean a good rule of thumb if you're looking to invest is the more wires in a device, the quicker it's going to be obsolete. So if you want to spend money, you're going to spend money on lenses, right? They don't die. Yeah. They, there's no, you know, there's some electric parts in the Canon for the autofocus and stuff like that, but in general, the lenses that Caleb talked about before, they're going to last 50 years from now. If you, Handle them. A good tripod, if you know what you're doing, it's going to last a long time. A good monopod, you know. It's really the camera's filmmaker's chuck. The cameras are, it's ironic because we're, we're into capturing images, but the camera just gets, especially these days, manufacturers replace them every three months, uh, even quicker. So so if you want to spend a little more money, that uh, I think that, are you talking about the Evolution series of the Sennheisers, the, the G100s? Is that what you're talking about? 
Caleb? Yeah, yeah, I think the newest one is like the G3. Yeah, so the EW G3 is the newest. I have the G2, but it's an animal. I've had that thing for like six years. And it's yeah, exactly. Awesome. So something like that, seven, eight hundred bucks might sound like a lot, especially if you're coming out of school or you're, you're an independent on a budget. But that's something that's going to last uh, a couple ways. It's going to last for years. It's not going to break down. Mics typically don't break down the same way cameras do or become obsolete. But also resale value. If you're looking to get out of game or you're done with a project. People will pay more for audio gear that's in great condition, a good mic or good lenses, as opposed to the body. The body's kind of like a car. The second you drive it out of the showroom, it loses a certain percentage of, of, of value. So invest in the stuff with fewer electronics, fewer wires in it as a good rule of thumb, because that's the stuff that will last and, and uh, become obsolete um, less quickly. Thank you. And I think this also goes into the buyer rent question. Ah, uh, yes. So would you recommend filmmakers to renting cameras, like long term? Do you know any setups that you could recommend like that? Um, yeah, I'm sure Do uh, has, has worked a lot with rental uh, stuff. Uh, my thing is if, like my rule of, of thumb when it comes to gear is if I haven't used it in six months, I shouldn't own it. In general, there's a couple items that, you know, you'll use twice a year and it'll pay for itself, you know, eight times or whatever. But in general, if I haven't been using it for six months, that's a good sign that I shouldn't have purchased it in the first place, or it's a rentable item. So um, there's a lot of people out there that get that gearhead mentality, and they're going to go out and buy like a Steadicam vest and all this stuff. Don't do that. Save that money and hire either someone to do it for you, or rent it or something like that. Rent it from a buddy or a friend. Um, a couple items that I think you can invest in um, is, you know, like, like we were talking about, lenses. You can't go wrong. Um, and you don't have to buy every single lens. Just if there's one or two lenses that you use all the time, like for me, uh, the zoom lens, a 50 millimeter and an 85. Like that's my B-roll slash documentary slash interview kit. Like I use those all the time. So I own those lenses, but I don't have a 70 to 200. And maybe someday I'll get one. But um, that thing, you you can rent that for four days at least here in Chicago for like 30 bucks. You know, 30 to 40 dollars. So wait till you have that project where you know you're going to need some extra lenses, and that's going to save you so much money. Um, lights, if you're going to do, uh, we used to rent. We would usually never use our own lights. We would just go out and rent just airy kits, um, the, the Fresnel kits. You can get those for pretty cheap from like Roscoe and other places. Um, so it really depends on your frequency of use, but uh, it's a great way to start. It's a great way to start. Rent yeah. It's 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 a it's a great question. Um, rent, you know, the the market has has gone weird. In the past, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you had to rent because no one could afford a fifty thousand dollar beta cam. You just couldn't, right? So you had to rent, and then the DSLR market made it pretty affordable. A thousand, two thousand dollars is well within the means of a a lot of folks. So the world that I work in is is journalism, and 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 so when my students are learning the craft. There's no better way of learning it than having the camera on you at all times. Uh, it's you're not going to be shooting your film at all times. Uh, and again, I'm talking about visual journalists that deal with stills and video. So uh, you know, I tell my students, I know you're broke, you're eating ramen, but if you can afford to buy that camera and you have it on you, as opposed to you know going to our equipment room to check it out where you have limited usage or only being able to use the gear when you have your project, it's going to improve you as the technician, right? Um, but now we're, I think we're getting back to the market again where we have cameras like the F55 that's again in the $50,000 range and even you know the C300 which is a $15,000 camera. Then you have to think twice, right? You can't, no, I'm not dropping, I'm a professional, I do this, I get paid to do this, I'm not dropping $15,000 on the camera. That's just not happening, right? Um, so I mean if you're a student and you're new to this and that's the focus I work in, um, what you can have on you is pretty important, and 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 Caleb's absolutely right. To get away from the gearheadism, I gotta admit, at one point I had like 25 lenses. I don't have 25 cameras. I've never used 25 lenses anywhere, and I'm down to about four that I use consistently. And that was just a, a function of six, the six month rule. I didn't touch these lenses for six months, and I just had to get rid of them. A, money's nice to have, but B, you know, they they deserve to be out in the world making pictures and not sitting on the shelf so I can tell my my buddies that I have the entire Zeiss collection, right? That just doesn't make make sense at all. And so that's, you know, we're not we make images, we don't make gear, and but we sometimes we we, we get that kind of backwards. Thanks. And out of curiosity, what are those four cameras that you've whittled down to? Oh did I say cameras? I meant lenses, yeah. Oh, um, lenses. 
Yeah, so the 24 to 105, the 70 to 200, the 100 macro, and the 16 to 35. And that's, oh, I'm sorry, 5 and the 50 prime. And that's, that's, that's kind of everything that I'll need. I'll use that all year round. But I was having, I was using really obscure lenses, and, and just it just looked nice to have a kit. Mm-hmm. But, a, but a kit is in your film, right? It just looks nice. And, and, and if you can avoid that, that will save you a lot of money and heartache. Great. Um, and so um, we have two questions from Alex on our Google Plus page, um, both about cameras. Um, and so he's wondering, um, do you guys foresee DSLRs with built-in XLR audio input in the near future? And then two, um, what is the battery life on the cameras that you demoed? Do you want to start, Caleb? Sure. Question one, no. <laughs> we're, we're not going to see that. Um, at least I don't think so. And that's because Canon, there's so much... Po- we were, Dew and I were talking about this before we went on air. Uh, there's so much politics with Canon. And if, if Canon has a feature on one camera that's more expensive, you're not going to see that feature on the cheaper camera. Um, you know, like his C100 and the C300, those have XLR. So why would Canon put that on a 5D Mark IV when, you know, that's going to cannibalize their other cameras? Um, this just sucks. It's just, you know, how they roll and, you know, it's a business thing. So we're not going to see that on, from Canon, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe someone else does that. Um, but I'm not seeing a lot of interesting action on Nikon's front or anything like that. I would guess maybe Panasonic would be the one to pull the trigger on something like that, possibly. But... Uh, second camera or second uh, question was remind me again. Um, so the second question is on the cameras that you demoed. Um, what's the battery life? Oh, battery life. Um, it depends on what the battery you use. On a, I don't let my cameras fall asleep because that makes me crazy every time it clicks off every minute or two minutes. Uh, I probably get. Um, half hour to an hour and a half, depending on the use uh, of battery life. What I recommend people do, though, is go out to, like, Switronics and purchase a battery pack. They make ones built for DSLRs, so it has a little end that looks just like an LP6 Canon battery. You just pop it in your camera, and then that'll give you, like, five hours plus. Great. Um, And so we just got another one from Joseph on our G Plus page. Um, do you guys have any recommendations if you're buying for an institution versus if you're buying for personal use? Maybe this is a good point you do. Um, uh, is there any gear or place of business should own at all times? Well, here, here's the thing you have to be careful with, right? Um, it, it goes, we're, we're a university, and so we are always mindful of, of what gear to get because if I set my students off on Canon, most likely they'll be Canon users their whole life, or a large part, right? Because you're just comfortable with the gear. So we want to make sure that we, we use a company that A will last. Uh, you know, obviously Canon's been around a while. A lot of manufacturers, what we don't want to do is jump on the, the hottest camera. So for example, Black Blackmagic has a new camera out, right? We could have bought a hundred of those, but you know, who knows if they'll be in the camera business in a while. So that's that's a concern institutionally because you wanna have a product that your 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 students or your the, the people who are in your institution can grow with after they they leave. Um, so that's one concern. But but I would get more pro end gear. Uh, again, when I say institution, I mean an educational institution. We have to get the the more the weather seal stuff, the the, the more pro stuff because our students just throw stuff around, right? They just throw stuff around, and, and it's just the nature of learning the gear and and the way they work. But but so for individual use, I think Caleb and I were talking about before, invest in the peripherals that make sense, the, the mics, the, the tripods. You know, uh, really pick a camera that you like, but the camera will be dead in three years. Not dead. You can still use it, but your your tongues will wag at something else in another year, right? I don't know the last time I got excited about a tripod. I just don't. I love my <laughs> tripod, right? Um, so institutionally, buy the, the pro stuff because people will beat it up. But personally, invest in the peripheral stuff. Great. Um, so let me just get our next question. Um, so, okay, we've had actually a few questions about shotgun mics. Um, do you guys have any recommendations for specific shotgun mics, you know, either for DSLR use, kill it, um, or otherwise? Um, yes. Road. Uh, make some great stuff. Really, the big guys, Rode, uh, Sennheiser, they all make some great stuff. 
Uh, I've used a really cheap one. I think it's an Asden, and you can pick that up for next to nothing. You know, if you're if you're looking for a budget. Uh, in general, though, it's one of those things you want to spend money on it because um, mics you can get all kinds of really interesting issues with those, and so the higher end ones are going to last you longer. So Rode, you can get a uh, really solid Rode mic. Um, and I'm trying to remember which one is better. I know the NGT, I think it is two. There are some issues. If you use an H4N, there can be some issues with the Rode mics. If you're not using an H4N by Zoom, then you know a Rode or a Sennheiser is going to take good care of you. Yeah, NG, NGT, is that what it is? NGT? Yeah, it's NGT3. Okay, yeah, NGT123. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that that's I mean in terms of mics that's one of those things you spend they they are the good ones are expensive but they're going to last you a decade, right? Yeah. So if you spend 700 bucks on a mic that's 70 bucks a year, right? If it, you know even longer than a decade and then you can resell them. So that's that's a good good piece of kit to invest in. Um, what one thing about that is that you is, Audio gets ignored so much in video. So one of the things, once you get your mic, talk to someone who's done audio before and, and get, a, get a quick tutorial or as many tutorials as you can on how to use it. Because what happens is that, you know, camera manufacturers decided somewhere along the way that this is where the shotgun should go, right? Or, or to the side. It was just because the camera had to be there. But if you ever go to any Hollywood set, there is no microphone here on the camera, right? The microphone is typically somewhere on a boom or their lab. So so you have to understand mic positioning. And so that's the that's the biggest thing. So you get a good mic, but then if you don't know how to use it, you just wasted a lot of money. So my advice is get, you know, bag borrow steal time with, with someone who's done audio. Um, you won't regret it because because if you don't, then you'll come back with these beautiful images, and your only option is to throw music under it because you didn't get any great nat sound, and that's you see a lot of that on Vimeo, you see a lot of that on YouTube. These beautiful images with no story and no natural sound, and sounds what brings you into the into the story. Sound is always what brings you into the story. That's why you know Hollywood spends tons of money on Foley and 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 sound mixing. So um, get a good mic, but also get someone a good instructor to teach you how to use it. OK, great. Um, so we're going to be taking questions for about 15 more minutes. So any of you viewers out there, if you have any burning questions, you know, please ask out. Um, and so you guys have been giving such amazing recommendations. Um, next, we're going to uh, go to a question from Ben on our G Plus page. Do you guys insure your gear? Um, if so, how do you find companies that insure video equipment? Caleb, or do you can feel free to take it. Um, yeah, so I am in the process of actually going through all of that. Um, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Um, what I should do is uh, do a post on that on my site because I can't remember off the top of my head the resources. But um, you can just contact various insurance agencies, and a lot of the times they'll be able to hook things up with you. Something you need to think about is whether you're doing an LLC or sole proprietor or anything like that. Um, and then the biggest thing is, uh, yeah, if you don't have gear insurance and you're like me and you're an idiot, um, think about what that's going to look like. You know, just imagine your entire studio went up in flames. Like, and when you start to think about how much we, it's amazing how much we put into gear. Like, you know, over time it doesn't seem like a big deal, but when you actually look around and count everything up, it's incredible. So uh, it's definitely something you want to do. Um, but I, I need to put some more resources together because there's a lot of stuff out there. There's um, resources out there and agencies that deal specifically with, you know, contractors and filmmakers, and they have packages for photographers and things like that. So uh, that's a really good question. I would say definitely, um, maybe figure, you know, figure out how much you're, you would spend on it. Uh, but it's it's a really good thing to have. Very important. Um, yeah, I have an LLC, and that one of the reasons for forming my LLC is to get insurance both. Uh, before I was a professor, I, I, I got um, health insurance through my LLC, but there's also a benefit of getting uh, companies, insurance companies recognize you, the company, as a potential client in terms of providing insurance services. So you, the production company, looks a little better than you, the guy with the camera, right? So sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll need, they, they may work with the individual, but a lot of times you get better perks, breaks, all that stuff if you're a uh, professional company. One thing I would also recommend in getting the package uh, along with, with the, the, the gear insurance is also production insurance. Um, a couple, what, what that means is you know you, you, you have the rental van, you roll in, you run into someone's house, for example, and, you know, on a shoot, 
uh, you, there's a liability there. And so you can get uh, production insurance to cover those, those kind of production-related uh, fiascos that might happen. So that's important. And also, sometimes, in my experience, uh, larger project, if you're shooting at certain locations, they won't even let you on without a certific certificate of insurance. So that's always good to get. In the past, what it's cost me for all my gear, uh, production insurance, meaning you know, if, you know uh, up to $2 million in coverage. So if something unbelievably tragic happened at a location, I can be covered for it. It costs around 1500 bucks. So not nothing, but uh, the peace of mind. If you're, if you're doing complicated shoots, if this is really your 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 business. I, I think it's um, yeah, it's important to have that. Thanks. Um, so to everyone watching, thank you for putting your questions. Um, I'm going to go to one from Federico, um, and he has a very specific question. He asks, "What do you guys think about the cine lens from Sammy um, and then Rokicon? I might have broken on. Broken on. Thank you. Um, he says that the price is amazing for us with the low budget." Um, yeah, those are those. Wait, what was the first brand? So Sammy and and then Broken On. Oh, oh, I'm Sammy? sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're actually the same uh, manufacturer. So Bauer. Um, I can't even. I know it starts with an S and then Broken On. They're all you know bundled. So if you look at all the different 85s, they're pretty much the same thing. Uh, there's just a couple different differences. I've done uh, some reviews on the Broken On lenses. And um, essentially, the only difference between those and the cheaper Bauer uh, brand version of that is that you're getting the declipped aperture, and you're getting geared um, lens rings. So you can just take your follow focus and attach it directly to the lens. You don't have to deal with those silly, you know, uh, lens gear ties and all that kind of stuff. And then the aperture, you can just grab that aperture ring and slowly adjust it, and it'll gradually change the exposure without the giant clicks, which is awesome when you need to quickly change your iris uh, or aperture while filming. Um, Quality-wise, uh, they're, they're really amazing, actually. The main thing I don't like about them is every camera has a slight tint. Nikons, you get kind of a cooler color uh, profile. On the Canons, you get warmer. And then on the Broconons, you get kind of a green. So that'd be the one thing is you might want to tweet, play with you know, your white mounts. It's very, it's not much, but it's just a little bit. Uh, but quality-wise, sharpness, um, I'm trying to remember who did it. Luke, uh, what's his last name? Um, Luke somebody, I'll see if I can put together a link, but he did a comparison between those, the Canon Cinema Primes, and the Zeiss CP2s. So cheap, cheap lens compared to some monstrous lens, and they held up really well. So uh, they're really, really good lenses. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's great advice. Uh, the thing with... With lenses, I encourage everyone, there's so many blogs, and there's great blogs, uh, like Caleb's is a great site that you can go, and I occasionally post stuff, and there's so many great resources, but at the end of the day, you just have to try it for yourself. I get a lot of questions, which lens, and I'm like, I can't tell you. I mean, you know, the, a classic 50 looks different than a modern 50, and the 50s within the same uh, company look different, and, and a lot of it comes down to aesthetics. Uh, when you're shooting video, it's very different than getting the sharpness of, of still images. Still images are critical, right? They're big and they're huge, and, and somewhere along the line, when, when, when the, the, the image goes through the lens, it gets processed down to, to, to the sensor, um, colors change, uh, you know, uh, processing happens, line skipping happens, all this stuff happens. So you got to play with the lens with your particular camera and, and slap it on and, and, and try it out. It's like going to a carnival and saying, what's better, popcorn or con candy, right? I mean, it's they're both great, but you got to, someone's going to favor one look over the other. And, and Caleb's absolutely right. You start learning things like Canon casts warmer and Nikon casts cooler and Zeiss casts Arctic cold, right? I mean, it's it's like these things that you have to learn, but, but there's nothing wrong with uh, something being cooler than warmer, it's up to your taste. So, so get out of there and get away from reading blogs <laughs> and, and slap, slap, slap like a, a lens on your camera and just go at it. I think that's the that's the best way. And if it's a eighty five dollar lens and you love it, good for you, right? You just saved yourself lots of money. You're not deficient compared to you know DPs that are shooting with you know fifteen thousand dollar glass. It's awesome. You just saved a lot of money. Yeah, and you can rent. Um... A lot of places don't rent it locally, but you can rent it from Borrow Lenses, I believe it is, uh, .com, and you can rent those for really cheap. So if you want to try, like, you know, the 24 1.4 or 35, whatever, or T 1.5, and you don't want to spend the money to try it, uh, just rent it for a weekend and for, a couple, you know, $10, $15 or whatever it is. Yeah, great advice, absolutely. 
we don't great. know. We're just two dudes who do this, right? You you guys have your eyes too, and you have your own vision. I mean, yeah. go on, go on, do it. We're just two guys who happen to love doing this, and and we're not right. We're just we, it just works for us. That's really great. I mean, we still want you to visit um, in a uh, Caleb's like really wonderful site, but that's true. You know, just go out and see for yourselves. Um, it's definitely the best way to learn. And by the way, I, and I'm not saying this because I'm his friend, Caleb says some one of the best sources of information. There's no no fat on there. You should definitely check it out. Um, it's it's one of the ones I, I, I enjoy. And we don't know each other, right, Caleb? So I'm just no. sure that's, that's a real <laughs> oh, that's a real gosh. testimonial. Yeah. Well shots. All right, great. Um, and so I just wanna in the last ten minutes of this chat, I just want to switch directions just a little bit. Um, and so we're holding this chat, of course, in conjunction with the results of our 2013 Documentary Tools and Equipment Survey, um, which we got res um, answers from over 147 people, including many POV alum, um, which we're in the process of releasing right now. Um, and you actually can find the first part of the results if you go to our website and um, search for the 2013 survey. And we'll also be posting the links, of course, um, after this chat is over. Uh, and then a lot of our uh, questions on the survey also have to do with uh, editing um, and file sharing. And um, specifically from you, Caleb, um, I'm wondering what recommendations do you have uh, for editing software that's best for work with DSLRs? Um, if you're on a Mac, we'll cover that first real quick. Probably the best all around is going to be um, Premiere. Um, I know certain film schools get into Avid and whatnot, but you know, using Adobe's Premiere is a great software. And now with the Creative Cloud, you can get that for pretty cheap. Um, don't quote me on this, but I believe it's around thirty dollars a month. You can sign up and get access to a lot of their stuff. Or if you have just one project and you need After Effects, it's like seventeen dollars a month, and you or for one month and you get the whole thing unlocked. Um, that's really good. It's really solid. If you're a Final Cut 7 person like I was, it's it's a little different, but you can, you know, once you get used to the keyboard, it's really not that much different. Uh, for me, I took the plunge and pulled the trigger on Final Cut X, which is, I'm sure, people you know, are throwing up in their mouths as they're watching this and hearing that. But if you're like me and you're doing, you're pumping out content, like, I mean, at some point, I'm, you know, filming and editing six episodes in a day or something ridiculous. And I am going directly to the web um, for all these podcasts and shows. So I use that because it's incredibly fast. I can whip together an episode, you know, a five-minute review in, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And then I can directly share it to Vimeo, YouTube, yada, 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 compress it all and get it ready for iTunes for the podcast feed. So if you're doing a lot of stuff like that, uh, Final Cut X is great. You know, don't worry. It's cheap, too. It's $300. So that's a great solution, but um, in general, for hefty projects, and if you're doing a lot of documentary work, uh, I would definitely recommend Adobe uh, Premiere. So for PC people, that'll work. Otherwise, for cheaper, you can use like Sony Vegas Pro, um, but Premiere is probably the best. That's great, because I know, you know for different uses, different editing software is needed. Do you have any recommendations for what editing software you usually use do or would recommend to people in different situations? You know, you know honestly, uh, for most of the stuff that people do out there, it's, uh, it's so funny. People will say, oh my god, you can't edit on Final Cut X or you can't edit on, on Premiere. It's just because you can't edit, right? All yeah. the software, the software will do it. You just have to learn it, right? It's, <laughs> it, there's, there's, you know, these, there's a lot of fanboyism in, in this world where, guess what? You can edit a film on Final Cut X. You can edit on Final Cut 7. If you have a really old machine, Final Cut Six, right? I mean, like it, it all it all works. So, so um, the part of the part of it is the, the consideration are two things I would put in mind is if you're working with other editors, you probably want to be on the same page, right? If you're if you're joining a team that is all X, learn X, right, and get X. If you're part of an institution like ours is Premiere, I got to learn Premiere, right? I was I had the, the same decision. But Caleb, going from seven to do I go X or Premiere? So that's one consideration. What, what's your workflow in terms of your team? And secondly, what's your price point? You know, if you have three hundred dollars to plunk down now, plunk it down, right? Uh, and get Final Cut X. But the Creative Cloud might be a good consideration. It's subscription, so you don't own the software, but you get to pay for that software over a year, right? So thirty bucks for uh, over a year is three hundred and sixty. So I mean, that's there's. 
there's consideration there. But do not get into the trap of thinking you cannot edit because you're on one platform or the other. Or, and don't think you can't make a film because you have one camera or the other. Right? Those are just complete excuses. Complete excuses. Um, so uh, I'll get off my high horse there, but for a second. But but really, that's the advice. You learn learn the craft. Learn what your 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 buddies are, are working on, or your uh, you know colleagues are working on, and and and, and gravitate towards that. Yeah, and, and do this you know correctly, you know right on, spot on with that because. Uh, you know, my only thing would be I would use it until it breaks. So I still use Final Cut 7, um, and it's holding up fine. I mean, it's a, it's been one of the best editor editing platforms out there. Um, so until that thing literally stops working, I'm going to use it because, you know, you put that money down for, for that software. But, yeah, it's I wouldn't worry about the people there freaking out about how Apple's changing everything with X. Great. Um, and then we have time for about two more questions. Um, so is there any, besides you know, camera and lenses and then editing software, are there any other tools that you guys love um, that you guys find always necessary on a shoot? For example, like a knife, Ziploc bags, anything else that might come up that you guys consider essential? Um, two things that I always end up using, and uh, I should have them, but they're in another room. Uh, is just some basic grip gear, uh, gaff tape and clamps. Like right now, I'm using clamps. I use clamps all over the place. They're holding up, you know, a power strip under my desk. Like I love clamps. So what I recommend is like if you go to Home Depot, um, buy some rope. So what I do is I have a piece of rope about that big, and I have three or four different types of gaff of clamps on there, different sizes. So it's just a giant, you know, strap of clamps, and I just loop that on my C stand while we're on set. And you'd be amazed how often you need that. You know, those stinking chandeliers. You get everything set up, and you realize there's a chandelier in front of something or blocking a hair view. Just grab a, one of those tough clamps and hold, you know, latch it up. Uh, and then gaff tape. I'll have another rope with, you know, four or five different types of gaff tape, and those are come handy so much. You know, you're you're about to film, you realize there's a, uh, uh, you know, a uh, exit sign glowing in the background. You know, just throw some black wrap over that tape it real quick or something like that. So those are two things I use all the time. And obviously, like, a Leatherman can't go wrong with that. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And you do? Yeah, gaff tape. That's every, uh, It's in my camera bag at all times. That's that's a big one. Um, also, I like to, I'm a little neurotic, so I like to double up on on things that I can't just run out if, if it breaks. Like, for example, for the, um, for the Mix Pre, there's this, special cable that you probably this blue overly expensive cable. Um, I'm not going to get one of these in the middle of nowhere. Uh, if this breaks, uh, this little tip bends. So I was packed too. So, you know, there's certain things you can probably get, like a mini to mini cable. You can probably run out and get that somewhere at a Radio Shack. But specialty items, I always double up on um, just for peace of mind, especially on the uh, I'm on the road. So a gaff tape, you cannot. Clamps all the time, absolutely. Clamps is another thing. They're just small. Um, it's the little things everyone focuses on, on camera and lenses, but that's the stuff that actually makes the image usable uh, before you hit record. So actually, I think Caleb has a great five things to put in your every camera bag on his on his uh, site, and I can't agree enough. That's that's the stuff that I have as well, and and it's going to save you time and time again. And and I just want to outro this with specialty cameras. Do you guys have any recommendations or experiences with, like, for example, the GoPro or, you know, cameras that you would use um, in very specific situations? Sure. Um, I haven't used many GoPros. Mm -hmm. um, I just always end up going with, I mean, I don't do a lot of helmet-strapped wild stuff. I'm just kind of boring like that. So I haven't used those a lot. <laughs> They're awesome, though. They're tanks. You can do a lot with them. Um, another specialty camera, it's a little more expensive of a specialty camera, but I just finished recently a review of the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera, and that has some really cool uses. Uh, it's, it wouldn't be my main camera for most things, but if you wanted to you know, do some drone shooting where you have like a helicopter, and instead of using a GoPro, you could use a uh, Blackmagic Cinema Camera and get a gorgeous, eventually raw uh, image. It's very small. Um, and then... If I were doing a production with, you know, like a Red Epic or something like that, or an Army Alexa, that camera would be a fantastic little B camera uh, because it's going to have that raw capability. It's nine ninety five, nine hundred, you know, thousand um, dollars. 
but it's it, I'm, I'm, it's good to have in the back you know back of your mind for certain projects where you can go out and rank one. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I've played with the GoPro, but no, not nothing really. It's it's one. Um, when you're doing, you know, I tell my students quite a bit. One important thing is you got to learn your gear really well. So there's a lot of options, but I always gravitate to the ones where I know the, where the buttons are. I'm not fiddling with the button to turn off to change the ISO or, or any of that kind of stuff. So I think I think sh shooters are a lot like that. They're kind of like musicians, right? Certain musicians like their brand of guitar. And I think uh, shooters are the same. Obviously, we're versatile and we can top around from camera to camera. But if I'm in a run and gun situation, I just know my camera really well. So I've kind of shied away from doing specialty cameras. GoPro, I know their uses, but I've never had a use for one. And I can get a lot of effects with the right lenses on the cameras that I do use. All right, thank you. So it looks like that's all the time we have. Um, we have a lot more really great questions that I would love you know, to keep on asking you. But um, So we posted the Twitter feeds to Do and Caleb's um, so you can follow them, and you guys can continue the conversation on Twitter or wherever else have you. Um, we also posted links to Kayla's blog, um, dslrvideoshooter.com, um, and then to Dew's personal site. Um, so we hope everyone will continue to ask questions and stay in touch. Um, and then at POV, of course, we're really excited about publishing the results of our 2013 documentary filmmaking um, tools and equipment survey. And so there you can see some of the top five um, cameras that people are using, including especially cameras like the GoPro, um, and then other really interesting findings. Um, so thank you so much for both of you for joining us. Um, that was great. Any, part? any remaining words? Um, no, this is a blast. I wish we had more time. Um, yeah, if anyone has questions, you know, you can send us or you know, shoot me an email or a tweet or something like that. Um, but I, I love this stuff. I do it all day. <laughs> yeah, same thing. Tweet at me or email me, and and really just get out and shoot, right? Um, yeah. Too much, too much time in front of the computer reading about this stuff. Just go out <laughs> and do it. So uh, that's my advice. All right. Well, thank you so much. All right. Bye, everyone.